On July 4, 1929, a real estate dealer named Vincent Elias stopped by the home and office of Vinnie Evangelista. Elias was there to close a business deal on a piece of property, but when he knocked, no one answered. What Elias would find behind that door would lead to chaos and panic, and even though the case would gain notoriety around the world, it would never be solved. Welcome to Malicious and Mysterious. I am Braley Parkinson, and I like history and true crime. So this is a show where we mix the two together. If that's your thing, remember to like and subscribe. Today, we are going to talk about the St. Aubin Street Massacre. Now, in this episode, we will be talking about two separate cases. They both took place on St. Aubin Street in different places, but same street. And one takes place in 1929, and then the other one takes place in 1990. What's interesting about both of these cases is that they happen in Detroit. And in 1929, the conditions of Detroit are not that different from what they are in 1990 in Detroit. In 1929, Detroit is booming but there's also a lot of crime and a ton of corruption in Wayne County within law enforcement and the government and things like that. And we've already talked about Henry Ford and how he kind of plays a big role in the corruption as well, as well as the prosperity, because this is where you can make $5 a day. So people come from all over. That brings a lot of people a lot of different places. It causes some friction between the different groups of people that are living in close quarters with not one another. And this is right before the 1929 stock market. So not only is it very prosperous in Detroit, there's also a lot of competition. Like some people, they don't like the fact that, you know, immigrants from other countries are coming and they feel like they're taking some jobs from people, from, you know, Americans. And then some people don't like the fact that a lot of African Americans are moving to Detroit from the South because they want that $5 a day too. And Henry Ford, he was, you know, a complicated man, but he did pay $5 a day no matter your skin color, your religion, what language you spoke, whatever, he still paid $5 a day. So it just attracted a lot of people. Now, the thing that is very similar in these cases in terms of, in 1990, Detroit is a city on the ropes. That same crime element and corruption is still present in Detroit in 1990. Law enforcement is dealing with corruption, government corruption, and there's just rampant crime. So in that way, these two cases are similar. Now, something that is different in 1990 is that there's no prosperity in Detroit at this time. The automotive industry is really winding down at this point. And Michigan, a lot of people don't realize it, but Michigan went through several like single state recessions as it moves into toward the 2000s. So let's circle back to Benny Evangelista, who at this time he was calling himself Benny Evangelist. Let's circle back to his place and let's learn a little bit about who Benny was. So Benny was a, quote, divine prophet who had basically started his own religion and was writing a prequel. He wrote a prequel to the Bible. As most of us know, religion pays well. And Benny was supporting his family and apparently creating streams of income with the money he made from healing people and reading fortunes. Benny left Italy for the United States back in 1904, and he first settled in Philadelphia. He lived with his brother, Anthony. But Benny started to have what his brother considered, quote, non-Catholic visions. And the two fell out to the point where Anthony was like, oh, no, you're out of here, buddy. Anthony's the older brother. And he actually had sent for Benny to come to Philadelphia with him for new opportunities. 
So this was disheartening for Anthony and he kind of, he cuts ties at this point and Benny ends up going to York, Pennsylvania, where he has an old pal from Naples, their hometown. And this friend is named Aurelius Angelino. Benny and Aurelius started to investigate the occult. The fact that Benny lived in York for a time is interesting. And I'm including that part because it's going to be important later, but also it will pop up again in the next episode that I do. Now, York, Pennsylvania, it's a town that will eventually become a place that people call like Hex County, things like that. Um, if you have ever been to Pennsylvania, you may be familiar with the fact that it has a significant population of Pennsylvania Dutch Anabaptists. In the next episode, we'll talk about Hex County. But for now, we just need to know that pockets of the United States were more open to faith healers, fortune tellers, and the idea of hexes and other paranormal and supernatural phenomena. I mean, we saw in... The torch murders, like the the girlfriend of one of the accused, she gets on the stand and there's something about fortune telling comes up in the trial and things like that. So we know that this is something that in in certain circles, mostly I'd say Protestant circles, you you will find the faith healing, um, you know, people reading fortunes. And uh, there actually are a lot of instances of people who claim to have had some divine revelations and they've written a book that is like an accompaniment to the Bible, or they say that their book actually is the quote unquote truth and you need it more than you need the Bible. So that's a different story, (laughs) but that's important to remember because as we're talking about Benny, some of this stuff might sound like, what, what was going on? But it actually wasn't as weird as it seems to us today during this time. So sadly, the dabbling that Aurelius did would contribute to the axe murder of two of his children in May of 1919. Now, this is a case, there's not a ton of information on it, but I found newspaper articles that say that Aurelius, shockingly, was originally released a few days after he murdered his twin sons because his wife wanted him home. She told authorities that they would leave for Italy straight away. And I guess that that was enough for authorities to let him out. The concern, this is an interesting concern because I, I'm thinking 1919, there are all types of asylums around the United States. But the concern was that it might not be fair to prosecute someone who they thought was clearly insane. So they let him out and the wife says, we're going to go back to Italy. We got some money, you know, but they don't go. So in September of that year, Aurelius was deemed to be criminally insane and he was committed to the Fairview Asylum. Now, Benny was horrified that Aurelius had attacked his kids and killed them. So he ends up heading off to Detroit. In Detroit, Benny found success as a carpenter, and eventually he started investigating real estate as a career. He would get married, he was living a good life, and, you know, it sounds like life was pretty good for Benny. But something stirred him to return to his interest in the occult. Benny started performing psychic healings. And although he was doing okay before adding in his little psychic business, his spiritual endeavors were pretty rewarding as far as a business venture. So eventually he purchases a beautiful home on St. Aubin Street. Benny's rise as a mystic and faith healer takes an interesting turn when he self-publishes the oldest history of the world discovered by occult science in Detroit, Michigan world private book by Benny Evangelista. Benny said the book covered history from 4,305. So 
before Adam to 1,116 years after Adam's birth. For those of you that enjoy reading about, let's call them unique religious groups, you know that the prophets of said groups usually claim they have the truth with a capital T. So this was this was Benny's game. Benny produced this book and he sold it. And he also, you know, was healing people. He had sermons in his basement, all this stuff. Some of Benny's clients paid $10 for a session. And remember, Henry Ford, the guy who's paying the most, I think in the country at this time, he pays $5 a day. So some people were spending two days earnings on Benny's services. Benny's basement had a bunch of wax dolls and paper mache dolls and celestial planets. And these figures were hanging from the ceiling. So he would give the sermons down there. And he also wanted to take the dolls and the celestial figures on like a little tour around Detroit. And possibly the country. I don't know exactly how far he planned on taking them. But um, venues were not excited about this. They thought that it would stir something up in the neighborhood. And while we're on that subject. So this particular neighborhood. It was, you know, some old articles will call it Little Italy. It's in the northern part of Detroit. And, you know, lots of immigrants from Italy that only spoke Italian and things like that. And it's interesting, his his brother stopped talking to him because he said that Benny was having non-Catholic thoughts and things like that. Well, some of these people, they also were Catholic and they liked the fact that Benny was kind of bringing in elements of Catholicism along with his faith healing and the, I don't know if they were deities or whatever he was making in his basement. He was kind of bringing some of that along as well. So... This was a great neighborhood from the BN because according to newspaper articles, the Detroit Free Free Press says that he was seeing some days 75 to 100 people coming in for faith healings or fortune tellings or whatever they were doing at his place. So this is very lucrative. So the night before the murders, Benny had contacted a watchman who was collecting lumber from a house that was being torn down. And Benny was going to pay for the lumber and use the money to complete the real estate deal he was supposed to close on July 4th with Elias. We don't know what happened that night, but there's speculation that whoever came into the Evangelista house did so around midnight that night. So on the morning of July 4th, Elias enters the Evangelista home to see Benny sitting at his desk slash altar with his hands folded like maybe he was praying, but his head is not on his body. It's on the floor. Sadly, Benny's wife and four kids also were murdered. Newspapers have varying accounts as to how Mrs. Evangelista and the four kids were murdered. Some say that their skulls were crushed. Others say that they were hacked into pieces and things like that. But as we've mentioned in the past, some of these newspapers were definitely looking for, you know, to be as sensational as they could. But clearly, whoever did this was a monster because the youngest Evangelista child was 18 months. And none of them were very old. All of them were under 10. So whoever did this was truly a monster. As with other cases of this time, people headed to the Evangelista house as soon as they heard what happened all from around the neighborhood. It was like a big crowd. They come to the house. Um, I'm, you know, like, The police do not stop them from possibly destroying evidence. Once again, in this time period, it's not uncommon for people to gather at a crime site. And it's not uncommon for 
the onlookers to kind of assist the police or the police to be open to what they have to say in terms of like helping them with the crime, even if they have no real solid information. So just like with other murders during this time, we do see some people are arrested um, fairly soon. So two men are taken into custody and the police found an ax buried under the floor of a barn six blocks from the Evangelista home. Here is what the Times Herald out of Port Huron, Michigan had to say about the arrest. Quote, certain stains on the implement were to be analyzed to determine whether they are blood. Discovery of the implement resulted in the arrest of Angelo DiPoli and Umberto, let's just call him an um, Umberto T because I can't pronounce that last name, behind whose home the implement was found. A pair of shoes apparently washed were found in the DiPoli bedroom. A long knife was also discovered in the room, end quote. So as you can see, this again... I mean, axes were, were common. If you're, if you're living in a barn, you probably have an ax somewhere and you may wash your shoes because they've been outside. Who knows? But these two guys were taken in and a few other people were arrested at times, but nothing came of those arrests either. The police didn't necessarily secure the area around the house, but they were able to get one fingerprint from the door. Investigating the crime was not easy either because a lot of the people that lived around Benny in the neighborhood, they were recent immigrants from Italy and they didn't feel really comfortable talking with the police because there was a lot of discrimination against Italians at that time. And I mean, like we talked about in the Witch of Del Rey, like just immigrants in general, you know, people were kind of against them being around and these people were kind of leery of talking to the police. The other thing is that no one would admit to even knowing Benny, even though we know he had this thriving business and people were coming to him for faith healings and things like that. The police said that by July 6th, the funerals of the evangelistas, you know, lots of people showed up. They, they filled the streets for this funeral, but everybody claimed that they had no, they didn't really have a personal connection with Benny. Also, Anthony, Benny's brother, he lived a few blocks from Benny by that time. He had also moved to Detroit. Like I said, it was Boomtown. So he had moved to Detroit, but he hadn't talked to his brother since he had been there. In fact, he hadn't talked to him since they parted ways in Philadelphia when Benny started having his visions. But he was obviously heartbroken. You know, it's one thing not to talk to your brother, but it's a whole different thing to hear that his whole family is wiped out and you never have a chance to repair that, those relationships. So really sad stuff that Anthony, you know, he was a couple blocks away and the brothers hadn't worked things out and he never got a chance to do that. In terms of suspects, the guys that they arrested weren't really, I mean, there was just not much evidence against them, but there were some groups and some people who did make better suspects. Now at this time in Detroit, the mafia, obviously with prohibition, they were active and there's something called the black hand. And basically these were extortionists. So the black hand originally was like this loosely organized group, you know, criminal organization where, um, People would extort like shop owners and, you know, business owners, people that own houses, things like that. They would extort money from them. And eventually it's absorbed into the mafia. And some people in Detroit even say, oh, that wasn't a thing or whatever. But you can read about them in the early 1900s and things like that. It's a criminal organization and, and all this stuff. So there was a thought that possibly maybe Benny was being extorted by them and he refused to pay. And that's why him and his family were killed. But the type of murder, the fact that the whole family was taken out, it just seems like it's it's something more than just like a group that tries to extort money from people. I would assume that they're just not that organized if that's what they're doing. 
Now, with that said, it could have been some type of mafia syndicate because a lot of the black hand had been absorbed into the mafia by this time. The most likely suspect, believe it or not, is Aurelius Angelino. Remember the friend who killed his kids and went to the asylum and was committed? Well, let's go back to him. In 1923, Aurelius escaped the Fairview Asylum. It was thought that he was killed by a freight train in Baltimore in 1927, but his identity was never confirmed. Aurelius murdered his children in the same manner in which the Evangelistas were murdered, which is very curious because his boys, he bashed them in the head and then he hacked them with an ax. Now, Benny, obviously, the ax decapitated him and the wife and the children, according to most newspaper accounts, had their heads bashed. So, uh, very interesting. This is an, a lead that police try to follow up on in 1931. They go to try to see if they can match the fingerprints from Aurelius to the one that they took off the door. And it's close, but not a perfect match. But... With all of that said, one thing that I've noticed from reading these old newspapers from the 20s and 30s is that vicious, brutal murders like with axes are not that uncommon. I mean, they're not happening every day during this time, but if you think about it, an axe is going to be much more accessible in the 1920s than, say, a gun. So, I mean, it's, it's not that strange that an ax was used by Aurelius to kill his kids and then also by who, whomever killed the evangelistas. Of course, a terrible murder like this produces stories of hauntings. Eventually, the house was torn down and to this day, the lot sits empty. Every now and then, the newspapers in Detroit run a story about the Evangelista murders, but it is likely that that crime will never be solved. Now we need to move through time up to 1990. I mentioned earlier how Detroit was struggling at this point. It's a city on the ropes. After the riots in the late 60s, Detroit really started to see a decline. Now that decline started in the 1950s, but it picked up speed in the 1970s. A lot of neighborhoods emptied out. Some people, they have been living in these neighborhoods for generations and they held on to the houses because you could rent them. Finding a job in the city of Detroit at this time would be difficult. The school's the public schools that really deteriorated to the point where a lot of people were graduating and they could not really read. They were functionally illiterate. And there was actually a lawsuit a few years ago saying, hey, you know what? I graduated from Detroit public schools and I can't read. So this is a time when the city is really getting to the point where long dedicated residents are thinking, I need to get out of here. I've raised my family here. I may have grown up here, but I need to leave. And my family would leave soon after this time. We ended up moving to Southfield, which is something that a lot of Detroiters did. They moved to Southfield, Redford, Farmington Hills. Like they just had to get out of the city because it just became too dangerous. You, it went from, if you were maybe involved in some type of criminal element you were in danger to you could just literally be walking down the street and you could get shot even though you hadn't done anything so that is what we're dealing with so just like in the previous 
St. Aubin Street Massacre, six lives were lost this time around as well. Four men were shot on the second level of the two-story bungalow, and two victims were shot while they were trying to run downstairs. This is such a sad, senseless, ridiculous crime. The youngest victim was just 15 years old. He attended Von Steuben Middle School. His name was Robert Hill, and he had a bit of a reputation as being troubled. He would fight a lot at school, but his classmates denied that he sold drugs. He had, however, been arrested for car theft in the past, but there were no cases against him at the time of his death. Bobby Frazier was just 16 years old, and he was a sophomore at Persian High. He was quiet, kind of kept to himself, and he dressed well. The principal at Persian at the time said that they weren't that familiar with Bobby. He skipped school often, and he hadn't participated in any extracurricular activities. In fact, the principal said he wasn't well known at school. He also had been arrested for car theft, but there weren't any cases against him at the time of his death. Levon Robinson was a graduate of Persian High School. His family, at the time of his death, did not want to comment. Carl Williams was 21. He didn't have a job at the time, but he had worked at a supermarket. He had a five-year-old daughter at the time of his death. His family said, we don't know why Carl was at that house. Stephen Owens was the oldest person to be killed in this second massacre on St. Alban Street. He was 32, and he was the person that was renting the home where the shootings took place. He had been involved in car thefts throughout the years, and he had been convicted a breaking and entering, and receiving stolen property in the past. He also had been in jail for violating parole, and he was a known crack cocaine dealer around the neighborhood. This crime was the worst multiple murder Detroit had seen since seven people associated with a heroin ring had been found shot execution style in an apartment in 1971. This time, the drug of choice was crack cocaine. Crack is highly potent, and because it's inexpensive, its distribution was decentralized. The gangs of Detroit sold it, but so did individuals. By 1990, crack cocaine was everywhere in Detroit. Carl Taylor, an adjunct professor at Michigan State University at the time, called crack the Yugo of narcotics. For those of you who don't remember, the Yugo was a subcompact car made in Yugoslavia, a country located on the Balkan Peninsula in Europe. It was a satellite country of the USSR, and it has since split into several small countries. But this car, the Yugo, it was inexpensive, it had a bad safety record, and it wasn't easy on the eyes. Back in the late 1980s, a woman's Yugo was blown off the Mackinac Bridge. Now, she was reportedly speeding, but I remember how the incident further tarnished the Yugo's reputation. Anyhow, this is what crack was to the drug world. Like the Yugo, it was cheap, dangerous, and easy to obtain. The shocking thing about the second St. Aubin massacre is that there were witnesses to the crime. It also seemed that most people in the neighborhood were pretty clear on what had happened in terms of why the crime was committed. 
witnesses reported that a woman in a long black coat, along with two men, went up to the porch of 17800 St. Aubin, knocked on the door, and when it was answered, the woman and the two men pulled out guns and rushed into the house. Initially, the police said that this was some type of drug deal gone bad or some type of turf war. But the people in the neighborhood had a different assessment of what had happened. Witnesses that did not want to be identified told the Detroit Free Press that, quote, this was jealousy. It was a girl who was delirious because he dumped her. And then another person said, it was a personal thing, a quarrel type of thing. People in the neighborhood knew that Owens was a drug dealer. But dealing drugs was not why he was killed. Instead, the rumor was that the ex-girlfriend, who was about 5'6", she had a scar on the left side of her face, and was probably about 19 years old, because Owens had moved on, and at the time that this group showed up at the house, Owens' new girlfriend was there. Witnesses would also say that at least four people escaped from the house. So if you go to search for information about this crime, you will find several videos and articles about how the people that were arrested and charged were were wrongly convicted and things like that. But something that's very interesting about this particular crime is that there are people that were there. Some were able to get out of the house. Others The young lady that was dating Owens, she was left alive. So to say that all of these people would come to a consensus that the suspects were the people that came in and committed the massacre seems a little far-fetched to me. Also, when we talk about the person who is thought to be the ringleader of the crime, Tamara Marie Marshall, she was the fourth child in her family, there were five kids, to be charged with criminal homicide in four years. Now, I don't want to judge somebody by their family, but that's pretty interesting. Tamara was 18 at the time of the crime, and one of her brothers, who also was arrested and questioned in connection with the St. Alban Street Massacre, said that she was a very quiet girl and In order for her to have shot someone, then her back had to have been up against the wall. Tamara had attended Northern High School, but had not graduated. And it doesn't appear that she had a job or was pursuing any particular career at the time of her arrest. Jamal Biggs, age 19, and Mark Bell, 20, were the two boys that were with Tamara when she went to the door on St. Albans Street. Now, there was one more person involved, Mark Kaysen. He was 19, and he remained outside of the house. He stayed in a Black Ford Taurus in front of the house and waited for Tamara, Jamal, and Mark to come back out of the house. Now, when they exited the house, witnesses say that they had garbage bags with them. So this was one of the reasons that police were thinking, okay, this is some type of, you know, drug heist or robbery or something like that in the beginning. But it is later confirmed that Tamara was, in fact, seeing Owens at some point. Once again, because this was a drug house, there was a lot of traffic. Witnesses said that four people escaped the house while the shooting was going on. And at least three others approached the house during the shooting, but when they heard gunfire, they ran away. Sadly, everyone that was arrested for this crime, except for Mark Kaysen, had previous criminal records. Tamara Marshall had had drug offenses 
in prior years. And she also had dropped out of school in the ninth grade. So that means that she had been pretty much free, I guess, just out in the world from November 1987. So she had a couple years where she just was not in school. I'm not sure exactly what she was doing. But I mean, as a teenager, not having school to kind of ground you, I mean, it, it leaves you open to get into a lot of trouble. And then Jamal Biggs, he also had two counts of armed robbery. He had, um, he was on parole at the time of the crime. And then Mark Bell, he had been charged with carrying a concealed weapon, armed robbery, and felonious assault. The only one out of the four that did not have a criminal record was Mark Kaysen. And he is really someone, he ends up driving these guys to this house. And it's really sad because he had nothing on his record. And this is going to end up stealing precious years of his life. But let's get back to the events and how they unfold. I am going to read an article from the Detroit Free Press. It was published on September 2nd, 1990. It's written by Joe Sickert. A winding flight of 13 worn gray wooden steps leads to the second story of 17850 St. Aubin Street, a creamy yellow bungalow with brown trim. It was up there that five men were stretched out on the floor and shot. Down another flight of 13 steps from the first floor to the basement, a crusted black stain marks where another man was put on the floor, face down, and killed. It is a small house, so small, it is hard to imagine how at least 13 people were packed inside April 4th, crowded by fear, desperation, and systematic death. In Detroit Recorder's Court on Tuesday, the law will begin to sort out what happened during that hour of death five months ago in the crack house on St. Aubin. Two young men and a woman will stand trial for first-degree murder charges. A third young man is to stand trial later. According to interviews, investigators, witnesses, and confessions, the mass killing was small-time crime gone malignant. Without the staggering body count, it might have remained a chump change dope ripoff. The take, investigators estimate, was less than $2,000 in cash, perhaps three and a half ounces of cocaine, and electronic equipment, gold jewelry, other drugs, and more than $700 were left behind. The following account of Detroit's worst mass killing in nearly 20 years is drawn from interviews, court records, and testimony, investigative, medical, and laboratory reports, and confessions by three of the suspects. Some survivors' names have been omitted because of potential danger to their lives. The plan was to, quote, hit a lick. The series of actions resulting in fatal convergence at St. Aubin Street began taking shape about 3.30 p.m. when car thief, police informant, and crack dealer Steve Owens visited his new girlfriend at her home in another neighborhood. The young woman, identified only by her nickname, Janet, because of threats against her, seemed an unlikely match for Owens. At 32 years old, 6 feet 1 inch and a half and 200 pounds, Owens looked more like the petite girlfriend's father or uncle. Although 20, Janet, with her slight build and teeny voice, could easily pass for a child just edging into her teens. After visiting friends, the couple decided to go roller skating. But first, Owens wanted to go to his home on St. Aubin to shave and clean up. Meanwhile, police believe a former girlfriend 
was laying her own plans for an evening with Owens. Tamara Marie Marshall, friends call her Honey, was with Mark Kason, a bookish-looking 19-year-old. Kason told police he picked up Marshall in his mother's new black Taurus near Nine Mile in Losser in Southfield about 6 p.m. Marshall and Kason seemed like an unlikely pairing. Kason, with the look of a youngster on his way to the library or church, had no criminal record. Marshall, at 18, had several brushes with the law and her family had been involved in a fatal shootout at a motorcycle club. Kason drove to the home of Mark Bell on American and Tireman. At the house where Jamal Biggs waited, talked turned to getting money. Biggs and Kaysen later told police it was Marshall who suggested robbing Owens. Tamara said she wanted to go to Steve's house and hit a lick, Kaysen told police, explaining that meant pulling a robbery. He said he had known her only two months and knew she sometimes carried a gun. Biggs told police Marshall had laid it all out. She would get them inside Owens' door and they'd let Bell in later. Marshall's version to the police was different. She said she took Biggs and Bell to Owen's home to buy drugs. What eventually happened, she told police, took her by surprise. Whether seeking drugs or a ripoff, the four people left in two cars. Marshall and Kason in the Taurus, and Bell and Biggs followed in a white coupe. The boys parked around the corner from the St. Aubin home near I-75 in East McNichols and Marshall walked up St. Aubin past the block's carefully tended homes. There was no time to run. At 9.30 p.m., Owens and Janet arrived at the house just as Marshall walked up. Janet went inside, leaving Owens and Marshall talking outside. Janet said she did not know Marshall, but said Owens had spoken of her. She testified that Owen said Marshall set up people and robbed them. Inside the house were Carl Williams, 21, an unemployed grocery store worker, and Bobby Frazier, 16, who was staying at the house. Five minutes later, Marshall and Owens went inside. Marshall stayed about 10 more minutes chatting with Frazier and Owens. After Marshall left, Janet went upstairs to watch a video while Owens got ready for roller skating. Kason told police Marshall returned to the cars to collect Biggs and Bill. The three returned to the house while Kason waited in the car. Biggs and Marshall went to the door and Bell waited outside, Kason said. Janet testified she didn't know Marshall had returned until she heard her shouting out for Owens. It took three calls before Owens went downstairs to see what she wanted, Janet testified. There was nothing to distract her from the movie she was watching, Janet said, until Marshall walked into the bedroom and pulled a pistol. Janet thought it was a joke until Marshall quickly corrected her. You must think you're really bad. You don't think I'll really shoot you, Marshall said, recalled Janet. Marshall searched Janet's purse, Janet said, then ordered her downstairs. There was a shove at the foot of the stairs, Janet said. The stairway led to the dining room. There, Janet saw Owens, Frazier, Williams, and a man she didn't recognize, later identified as 15-year-old Robert Hill, seated on the dining room floor along the wall. Over them, Janet said, two men with guns stood and barked orders. Death awaited. Precisely how the killing started might never be clear. The confessions of Biggs, Kason, and Marshall have been characterized by authorities as conflicting and self-serving. Bell, who is awaiting trial in another murder case in which a man was killed in a robbery that netted $2.70, refused to speak with police. Despite the many contradictions, a basic scenario can be pieced together from confessions, evidence, investigators' reconstructions, and the survivors' accounts. With four people held at gunpoint in the dining room, the situation began to unravel as people kept coming to the door. Biggs told police he got rid of one group by saying the house was out of dope. He said another group spotted the hostages lined up on the floor and took off running. Something had to be done, Biggs told police. 
One by one, the captives were herded up the 13 stairs and distributed amongst the three small bedrooms. Janet was last in line. Janet said Marshall show, showed her a blend of compassion and callousness. Although Marshall took her rings and necklace, Janet said she let her keep her earrings. Janet later wore them to court as she testified against Marshall. Marshall's kind gesture was fleeting, Janet said. When one of the gunmen asked what to do with her, Janet said that Marshall shrugged her off. I don't know nothing about the bitch, Janet quoted Marshall. Go ahead and kill her. I don't know her. Upstairs, Belle asked Janet her age. She lied, saying she was 14. This apparently enraged Belle, who began kicking Owens in the head, demanding how a 32-year-old man could be involved with such a young girl. The victims were face down on the floor. Owens was stretched lengthwise across the doorway of the north bedroom. Across the narrow hall, Frazier, Williams, and Hill were in the south bedroom. Hill, next to a bed, was facing away from the door while Williams and Frazier were lying with their heads toward the, wall, the hall. Janet was ordered face down in the central bedroom by herself. She was quickly joined on the floor by Rodney Lewis, a close friend of Owen's, and by a man named Ivan. Ivan, by all accounts, was extremely drunk or high. The gunmen kept shooting. Events began to move more quickly. Janet, her head down, listened to frantic running up and down the stairs. Then it started. One of the guys said, keep shooting them. And I heard them walking from room to room just shooting, Janet said. It would not take long. The hallway can be covered in three paces. The shots came closer, Janet said, until they shoot the person next to me. And all seven shots were fired upstairs. Each man was shot in the head. Owens three times, the guns two twenty-five caliber pistols, according to police laboratories, were fired close enough to blast gunpowder into the scalps of the victims. Footsteps clattered down the stairs again, Janet said. More bullets and bloodshed. Another deadly episode was beginning just outside the house. Two teenagers, LeVon Robinson and a friend, cut through a vacant lot to Owen's back door. The teenagers were going to the crack house, testified the survivor, just to be over there, tripping out, capping jokes, having fun. As the teenagers neared the back door, a woman, apparently a crack user, joined them. When no one answered their knocks, the three walked to the front. Through the wide open front door, they saw the ransacked living room. Turning, they saw Biggs approaching from the street. We asked him what happened, the survivor testified, and he said that somebody had run up in that house and somebody stuck it up. Biggs followed the survivor, Robinson, and the woman into the house. As they looked around the ransacked first floor, Bell came down the stairs and the mood went deadly serious. He told me to get my hands out of my pocket, the teenager said, and close our eyes. The teenager said he obeyed the order. But I thought it was a joke. And my friend Levon? He dropped the movie he had in his hands and started crying and telling the man not to shoot him. We haven't even saw him. Shut up, said Bell, testified the teenager. The teenager said Biggs put a gun to his head and Bell put a gun to Robinson's head. The three newcomers were ordered on the floor, he said. Me and Levon and the lady, we all started crying, the teenager said. And then they said they were going to take us in the basement. Bell put the pulled the teenager's hood over his head and put his foot in the back of his neck, the teenager testified. Robinson was taken to the basement, the teenager said. Bell took his foot off his neck and headed toward the basement, the teenager said. Robinson was sobbing and pleading. I heard a gunshot, he said, and then I started crying. When a teenager heard footsteps going out of the house, he waited a moment and bolted for the front door. Biggs was on the porch, he said. Biggs hollered, freeze! Where do you think you're going? The teenager said. He said he answered by slamming Biggs against the wall. The teenager said he punched Biggs in the jaw, jumped from the porch, and ran for home. In the basement, Robinson was face down at the foot of the steps. A three fifty seven Magnum slug had ripped through the top of his head. She was the only one left. Back upstairs, Janet said she heard the shot, followed by more footsteps and rumbling around. Then she said Belle entered the room and sat on the bed. 
He is telling me that he's not going to kill me because I was 14. I was young, she testified. She then said he warned her not to inform on him. He is telling me, don't say anything about what happened or he can catch a case. More feet pounded up the stairs, she said, and Belle left as Marshall urged the others to hurry up and that she did this too many times to get caught. In the last minute confusion, the female crack user and Ivan, the inebriated man, escaped the house unnoticed and unharmed. Outside, according to his confession, Kaysen waited as his companions loaded the trunks of the two cars. The four drove off. He said they went to a West Side Detroit motel where the goods were divided. He said his share was $400 and $130 worth of rock crack cocaine. He said he kept the money and threw away the drugs after driving Marshall home. Back on St. Aubin Street, the small house was quiet after nearly an hour, filled with running, slamming doors, shouts, tears, and gunshots. Waiting a few minutes, Janet opened the window and crawled onto the roof and began screaming. They shot them all, she cried into the night. And that is the end of the article. During the trial of the second St. Albans Street Massacre, jurors were threatened, witnesses were threatened, and the judge threatened to lock up anyone who tried to get some type of vigilante justice for this crime. Eventually, the three major players were found guilty, Biggs, Marshall, and Bell. They all are still serving life imprisonment sentences to this day. Now, Kason, Kason decided that to lesser charges, reduce murder charges, because he said he was a getaway driver. He admitted to that, but he said he had no idea what they were going there to do. But the prosecutor did not accept this plea because he said that Kason was trying to say that he didn't know that the people were armed or that they were going to the house to pull off an armed robbery. So that just wasn't, I mean, to be fair, I mean, yeah, you can plead guilty, but I just don't believe that you're hanging out with these people that have criminal records and you don't think that there's going to be trouble. Clearly, it looks like he was being used because he had a vehicle. And since he's the only one that doesn't have a criminal record, it really seems like he was either trying to hang out with the cool crowd or something like that. He met these people and he was going to do what they said so that he could kind of fit in. If you watch this on YouTube, make sure that you check out the pictures because you will see he looks distinctly different than the other three. He does look like some kid who's headed to the library or to church or something like that. So I really feel like he he was just used for his car, but he was a participant. So, you know, if you're going to plead guilty, fine, but you do have to admit that you knew this was a bad crowd to be hanging. Eventually, Kason is sentenced to 10 to 20 years for being the driver. And at this point, he is no longer in prison. There are some speculative pieces out there about, oh, what happened to him? Where is he? Things like that. Um, he's out there living his life probably trying to make amends for this terrible deed that he was participating in when he was younger. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of conspiracies about this case saying that, oh, you know, like the Detroit police were corrupt and they forced confessions and things like that. And yes, that is, that is absolutely true. Like I said in the beginning, there was corruption in the police force during this time, definitely. But I think that you just have too many people around who are witnesses to it or the people in the neighborhood who just kind of know what's going on with the situation to say that this is a good conspiracy theory. I just, I just don't see it that way. I even found, this is like craziness. I even found like a, a GoFundMe for Tamara Marshall. Like people are saying, oh, she's not guilty and things like that. But, you know, I just think common sense, 
you drop out of high school in ninth grade, you're in the city of Detroit, which I mean, it's, it's kind of low on things to do for adults, let alone teenagers who don't go to school. And she was clearly hanging out with other people that had criminal records. Not that that necessarily means you are going to have issues, but we also have to take into account the fact that she was the former girlfriend of Owens. So that means that she probably was a minor when she was dating him. He was 32 years old and he was a known drug dealer. So clearly she wasn't like aspiring to um, a high level of responsible adulthood. Let's just put it that way. So that's going to be about it on these two cases. I did read a book about the 1929 massacre. I can't necessarily recommend it. It was okay, but it also, it brought in some other crimes that were, I don't know, they weren't really connected and they tried to make a connection. So I won't recommend that book, but um, I will say that the old newspaper coverage of both of these crimes was was pretty good. It's very interesting. And if you start looking into... The 1929 murder, like I said, you got to look at the best friend and things like that. It's really, it's kind of crazy. And that brings me to what our next episode will be about. It'll be about hex country in Pennsylvania. And this was something I had no idea about, but I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting once I started learning. And the fact that it's connected to the 1929 St. Albans Street Massacre, I thought was pretty you know, fascinating. So that's all for now. Remember to like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.